Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar and thank you to both for the nice introduction. So I will be talking to you about uh, Gator Bio, who we are and what our technology is. So the next few slides will be about uh, Gator Bio as a company, what we do, what kind of tools we are developing and what our technology is all about. And then I will hand it over to Dr. Wong. So introducing Gator Bio, who we are, our parent company, Access Medical Systems, is divided into two parts. Gator Bio makes products for research use only, and these include instruments, consumables, and software. And we have our customers in North America as well as all over the world. The other part, ET Healthcare, makes products for diagnostics. And while these are also being developed here in the US at our site in Palo Alto, they have been commercialized first in China. So this presentation from here on will be more about Gator Bio. So BLI and Gator Bio have a long legacy. Our CEO and founder, Dr. Hong Tan, founded Forte Bio back in 2001 and developed the first BLI prototype in 2002. The first BLI instrument, which many of you know as the Octet, was commercialized in 2006. Over the next few years, Forte Bio grew and developed many new products, uh, including instruments and consumables. Then in about 2018, our founder, Doc, Dr. Hong Tan, and our CTO, Robert Zook, realized that there is still more potential in BLI as a technology uh, to be applied to more novel applications, and the technology itself can be improved upon. So they founded Gator Bio in 2018. As of now, Gator Bio has three different instruments that can be used for different levels of throughput needs and a lot of a lot of consumables that I will be going over in the next few slides. So as of now, Gator Bio is headquartered in Palo Alto, California, but we have our sales and FAS teams all over North America. We have more than 50 granted patents, so our intellectual property portfolio is quite strong as well. Our install base is growing rapidly worldwide. We don't we not only have customers in North America, but also in different continents where we are conducting business in collaboration with our distributors. And we have our distributors in different countries in Asia, in Europe and in Australia. Our R&D team is in Palo Alto and they are constantly developing innovative products that you can see uh, we are constantly launching new biosensors to cater to newer applications. The consumables are also manufactured here in Palo Alto. So our R&D and manufacturing teams work very closely together to bring you these innovative products. Finally, we have a team of experienced field scientists and engineers, and also a very experienced team of sales reps that some of you have already met, and they are supporting our customers all over America. So today, Gator Bio is a team of some of the best minds in BLI. These include our CEO and founder, Hong Tan, our co-founder and CTO, Bob Zook, and Puli, the director of R&D, who has had more than a decade of experience in BLI technology and is currently leading the uh, development of innovative consumable products. Our products are used for different applications like quantitation, kinetics, and epitope binning of antibodies. We also have products for small molecule analysis, for gene therapy, and for lipid nanoparticle analysis. So we are diversifying our portfolio and are not only focused on proteins and antibodies, but are also going in the direction of viral vectors and non-viral vectors. So first of all, I'll talk to you about what BLI is, what it, it is as a technology, and how does uh, it de generate data on biomolecular interactions. Uh, so this animation shows uh, shows how BLI works. So BLI is a label-free detection system, detection technology for measuring biomolecular interactions. And it is based on the change in interference pattern that happens when light reflects off the surface of a biosensor. So as you can see in this in animation, when light reflects off the biosensor surface, it forms a certain interference pattern. And when biomolecules attach to the biosensor surface, there is a change in the interference pattern that can be detected as a positive nanometer shift and can be observed in real time using the Gator 1 software. 
Also, when biomolecules fall off of the biosensor surface, as you can see here in this animation, that interference pattern is detected as a negative nanometer shift in the Gator 1 software. So all our data can be viewed in real time and the user can get an idea of how their biomolecules are, are interacting. Gator Bio offers a total solution for biotherapeutics development, which includes Gator instruments. So this slide here shows our three instruments, the Gator Prime, the Gator Plus, and the Gator Pro. The Gator Prime is our lowest throughput instrument. It can be used with one sample plate and eight uh, readings can be taken simultaneously because it has eight spectrometers and it is compatible with the 96 well plate. The next instrument, Gator Plus, also has eight spectrometers, so which means you can take eight readings in parallel, but it can also accommodate a 384 well plate. So the number of samples that can be accommodated in one run are much higher. Our latest offering, the Gator Pro instrument, has 32 spectrometers, so 32 readings can be taken in parallel, and it can accommodate three sample plates, either 96 well or 384 well. So the sample uh, number of samples that can be run in each run is much higher, and this is suited to high throughput needs. Gator biosensors and consumables, as I said, in, uh, include different products for protein analysis, as well as viral vector and non-viral vector analysis. And then we have the Gator 1 software that is used for data acquisition in real time, as well as for data analysis, such as kinetics or epitope binning analysis or quantitation. So some features of the Gator instrument, it is a very low maintenance instrument because there are no fluidics involved. So it's very easy to use and very low maintenance and anyone can master it in a few days. And there are different instruments to suit different throughput needs, as I just mentioned, our three systems. And these uh, systems are all compatible with either purified or crude samples, such as supernatants, cell lysates, and plasma. So if you have crude samples that you need to quantify, the Gator system is compatible with those and you do not need to purify your samples. Another feature is that since it's a label-free technique, we are not altering the sample in any way. So if a user's sample is very precious, they can save the sample after analysis and reuse it for, uh, let's say, other downstream analysis. Our consumables include probes, and this uh, slide shows what the glass probe looks like. It is basically a glass rod with uh, about one millimeter in diameter. And the image on the right shows how different uh, things can be coated onto the probe. So two examples shown here are our protein A probe, which have a coating, coating of protein A, and these are used for quantitation of IgGs from various species. Another example shown here are the streptavidin probes, which have a coating of streptavidin on the tip, and these are used for kinetic analysis of biotinylated proteins. So these are just two examples to give you an idea what the probe looks like and how the surface is coated with different chemistries to cater to different needs. We have a full suite of applications, as I mentioned earlier. So we have a lot of biosensors for quantitation of IgGs from different species, such as Pro-A, Pro-G, and Pro-L. We have specific probes for human IgG and mouse IgG. We also have probes for um, his, his tag proteins, which include our his anti his probe and our nickel NTA probe. And then we have a for portfolio of four streptavidin probes that cater to different biotinylated molecules. Additionally, we can also make custom probes on demand, and these include probes such as anti-rat IgG, anti-rabbit IgG, anti-flag. We recently launched a streptactin XT probe, which binds to protein tagged with twin strep tag, which is a great alternative to his tags, especially for people growing, uh, expressing proteins in mammalian cell culture mediums. In addition to our protein portfolio, we have products for gene therapy, so these include products for quantitation of AAV capsids, as well as measurement of m to n pull ratios of AAV viral vectors. Coming to the Gator 1 analysis software. So our software, which again is very intuitive and very easy to use, it supports quantitation, kinetics, epitope binning, and viral vector analysis. The data can be monitored and acquired in real time and it is very easy to operate software, and then it supports all the data analysis that you need to do with your data. That was a brief introduction of Gator Bio. 
Uh, over to you, Dr. Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong will now talk to you about how BLI and Gator tools were used as a screening tool for uh, anti-CD1A antibodies. Well, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Bao and Subod and Gator Bio for this opportunity uh, to present today. So as Subod mentioned, uh, the title of the talk today is the development of a selective CD16A based NK cell engager utilizing antibodies targeting a single amino acid variation. Um, so I'm, again, this magnificent opportunity, really excited to speak on behalf of our company, Avangen, on what we are doing, especially in the cancer immunotherapy and NK cell engager space. So I, I think we are all in agreement and without a doubt that immunotherapy or harnessing one's own immune system to fight disease has revolutionized the oncology field and the type of treatment and care we have today for patients. We have witnessed an explosion of the number of FDA approved biologics uh, in this area and only within the past 10 years or so. First wave of drugs target novel checkpoint inhibitors, which allow your various cancer suppressed white blood cells to fight back harder and stronger. The first one, ipilimumab, targets CTLA-4 and was approved in 2011 and was followed by multiple PD-1 and PDL one drugs. The most recent approval has been rilatlimab, which targets LAG-3. All nine of these are monoclonal antibodies. And they are being used to treat not only hematological malignancies initially, but have also been shown to be effective and safe in treating a variety of solid tumors, such as cancers in the skin, lung, liver, kidney, and gastrointestines. They are oftentimes being used as first-line therapy over chemo and in combination with other medicine. I mean, this advancement is truly mind-blowing. However, as these drugs' effectiveness are limited to a subset of patients, the need for new drugs is ever present, and we hope the next generation of drugs have further clinical benefit. The second wave in the last decade has been CAR-T, a type of cell therapy using engineered T cells, which usually have an antibody component to it displayed on the cell surface in order for it to bind to tumor cells and elicit its cytotoxic and helper immune functions. Six of these therapies have been approved since 2017, so far all in hematological cancers. The third wave, T-cell engagers, are antibodies binding to at least two targets, one on the T-cell, usually utilizing the CD3 receptor, and the other to a tumor antigen in order to redirect or engage the T-cell to attack cancer. And while blinitumumab was the first approved drug back in 2014, three more were very recently approved, with many more in clinical trials. With CAR-T and T-cell engagers, they have differences and currently have some limitations to overcome as well. In general, most of the current CAR-T therapies are autologous, meaning you need your own blood cells taken out, engineered, then put back in. On the other hand, an allogeneic or universal cell therapy would be more convenient or off the shelf to directly infuse any patient with pre-engineered T cells. In this aspect, fee-made proteins such as antibody-based T cell engagers have a major advantage. And partly due to the above off the shelf factor, but also just the inherent biological complexity of cells versus a recombinant protein molecule as a drug, the cost of manufacturing and the logistics of treating a patient are significantly higher for CAR-T. One estimate of the total associated cost of CAR-T is about five times or more of a T-cell engager. On the flip side, CAR-T is usually a one-time administration and has a more durable response as the cells can continue to grow in patients for up to years. 
T cell engagers are usually administ administered by IV multiple times as the drug is cleared from your system in hours or days. It is good to note that there are efforts to extend the half-life of these types of drugs. And probably what is more widely known are the potential adverse events of T-cell-related therapy, like cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity observed in some treated patients. I want to make it clear that the FDA-approved drugs are deemed safe, and this illustration is a generalized and relative comparison. And lastly, both can be used relatively easy in combination with other drugs, which is great because there is a need to overcome some of these hurdles. So today, I'd like to explore with you an idea throughout this talk. What if drugs that recruit natural killer cells or NK cell engagers could overcome some of these challenges related to T cell immunotherapies? NK cell engagers should theoretically have similar biologic drug advantages as T cell engagers over cell ther therapy, but they would also harness another critical player of our immune system. What is an NK cell? In, in, in immunology, we were taught that an NK cell, shown here, is part of the innate immune system the first rapid response to an infection. Meanwhile, the adaptive immunity relies on B cells and T cells to generate a tailored attack with so-called learning and memory characteristics. Adaptive immunity is why we get uh, chickenpox only once and never again, and for the younger vaccinated generation who will never get chickenpox. And so antibodies and T cells have been all the rage in the field of medicine largely overshadowing innate immunity, at least until recently. If we look at the, the lineage of an NK cell, it is something of a platypus. As opposed to all its myeloid-derived innate immunity partners shown on the left, the NK cell is a lymphocyte. But unlike T cells and B cells, NK cells uh, lack receptors that undergo VDJ recombination, meaning they don't have receptors that can adapt to specific targets. Because they lack such special receptors, they were largely viewed as relatively homogeneous populations and comprising about 5 to 20 percent of the lymphocyte population. However, a study demonstrated that within any individual, we could have more than 30,000 phenotypically diverse uh, NK cell subpopulations based on differentially expressed markers. Now, we are just beginning to understand that just like with T cells, there are functionally diverse NK cell subpopulations. We have also discovered that some of these NK cells have memory-like or adaptive traits, meaning they can persist and attack a subsequent infection of the same antigen months afterward. What makes new NK cells unique compared to T cells and associated CAR T therapies is their cell killing activity is HLA unrestricted, which has two major implications. One, NK cells can target uh, cells that are not necessarily seen as foreign, but just abnormal, like tumor or infected cells. And two, it does not have the transplantation risk of graft versus host disease and related cytokine release syndrome, allowing for more suitable allogeneic cell therapy as CAR-NK, as an example. In order to select the right target expressed on NK cells for proper NK cell recruitment, we will need to first understand NK cells' various roles. There are a multitude of activating receptors, such as NKG2D and NKP46, and there are also a multitude of inhibitory receptors, including the killer immunoglobulin receptor family, or KIRs, as well as NKG2A. The total binding of activity and inhibitory receptors will tip the scales to whether or not the NK cell is activated. Once activated, NK cells can have multiple cytotoxic mechanisms against the tumor cell. One, direct lysis by secreting granules. Two, inducing FASL death receptor-mediated apoptosis. And three, antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, or ADCC. 
Furthermore, NK cells secrete various cytokines that help recruit various other immune, uh, immune cells to eradicate tumor cells. CD16A, also known as FC gamma receptor 3A, stands out as an attractive target as an engager for several reasons. While NK cells do not express receptors that can adapt to specific targets, as previously mentioned, CD16A binds to the constant domain of antibodies, specifically human IgG1 and 3 subclass isotypes, to elicit ADCC in a target-specific manner. By engineering bispecific antibodies with the CD16A engager and a tumor-associated antigen antibody, we essentially covalently join this pre-existing uh, CD16A and antibody, or two-part system, into one and utilize the cell's existing natural machinery for all of its cytotoxic and helper functions. PD16A mediates both ADCC and induces cytokine production, such as interferon gamma, to recruit other cells. Also, it is important to note that the various receptors and cytokines illustrated are not all expressed constitutively and may change during the development or specialization of each NK cell. For example, NKG2A expression is lost upon NK activation. CD16A in particular is expressed on both activated and mature cells with enhanced cell killing abilities and also on self-renewing adaptive NK cells, both types that are useful in targeting a tumor cell. Indeed, within the last five years, and this is not uh, an exhaustive list, large biotech and pharmas have recently made high dollar deals with smaller biotechs to develop NK cell engagers, and notably targeting CD16A. Developing antibodies uh, targeting CD16A is compelling both biologically and commercially. So how would we go about it? And what would, we, what would be the ideal antibody profile? Well, we, we will need to first examine CD16A at the molecular level. CD16A is part of the type 1 FC receptor family, with CD16B closest in homology. Each receptor has varying affinities to different immunoglobulin classes and have different effector functions. PD16A is expressed on NK cells, macrophages, and a subpopulation of T cells. And a single poly uh, nucleotide polymorphism creates higher FC binding and thus higher ADCC with the valine at position 176 than a phenylalanine. The allele frequency is roughly 4060. And CD16B is expressed on granulocytes like neutrophils which is the most common type of white blood cell. CD16B comes in two flavors, NA1 and NA2, and all of this is important to consider for the desired or target antibody profile, which is we want antibodies with high affinity for both CD16A, V, and F alleles. However, it should not bind to CD16B, NA1, or NA2 as much as possible, this is an important consideration for two reasons. Uh, one, neutrophils are the most common white blood cell and would act as a sink and absorb most of the circulating drug if it bound to CD16B. And two, neutrophils also have ADCC function, but use FC gamma R2A as the receptor while actually using CD16B as a negative regulator for ADCC, making it counterproductive. Functionally, it should block FC receptor binding to other IgGs. Uh, this should be pretty easy to achieve as the interaction is, is weak. It's anywhere from the high nanomolar to low micromolar affinity range. And it should recruit and activate NK cells only in the presence of target tumor cells. For preclinical toxicity studies in non-human primates, we would also like to have cross-reactivity to the synomologous monkey CD16A. 
Now, when we align the amino acid sequences of the relevant target and, and non-target proteins, here lies the crux of the problem. The extracellular domains of CD16A and CD16B have a 98 to 99% sequence identity. In red are the positions where only one of the alleles, either on CD16A or CD16B, are the same, which is not ideal. And only three at three amino, amino acid uh, residues here shown in green are where they are the same in both alleles in CD16A and different in, in both CD16B, NA1, and NA2. Now, when we consider the appropriate methods for antibody discovery, we would argue that in this situation, any animal immunization-based discovery efforts would fail from the start, uh, or at best might succeed, but with a less efficient and resource-intensive method. The first challenge of immunizing, let's say, a transgenic mouse would be to obtain a robust immune response, as FC receptors are highly conserved across species. If we are lucky enough to have an FCR knockout mouse, on hand, or we break immunological tolerance and obtain a strong immune response. The second challenge would be to determine from serotiter the presence of CD16A specific antibodies, as the majority of antibodies raised will likely not be of interest and will mask any interpretable signal. Also, if CD16B is just slightly more immunoreactive than its counterpart, which we wouldn't know at this stage, it would make an already needle to in a haystack uh, type of intensive screening campaign even worse. So personally, I would not send our scientists down this hole. At Avangen, our discovery platforms can efficiently tackle a wide range of targets, including difficult ones like CD16A. Our germliner library collection are very large yeast display libraries containing fully human antibodies that are displayed on the cell surface using a novel and proprietary technology independent from other companies. For each campaign, we introduce more than 100 billion yeast clones, and we have it in three antibody formats. We have our Avant Epe, which is our single chain FE library, our Avant Foil or VHH heavy chain only library, and our Avant Saber fab formatted library which is what we used for this NK cell engager program. In the second half of this presentation, we will demonstrate that the antibodies obtained with our discovery platform will meet the desired target antibody profile in expression, affinity, specificity, stability, immunogenicity, and other developability requirements. And for three critical and interdependent reasons, design, display, and screen. Design. We deep sequenced over 500 individuals to understand the antibody immune re repertoire and formed a human antibody database. With this data, we gained insight on the general frequency of all amino acids at each CDR position for each antibody framework. The figure shows the distribution of a particular variable region heavy chain framework where the germline amino acid is shown here underlined in red. And any other amino acids observed and its frequency are represented as the color-coded stacked bars. For example, uh, for this particular variable region heavy chain framework, CDR2 position 55 has a glycine as germline with a 40% frequency of having an arginine instead. Positions 56 through 58 are two isoleucines followed by a proline with no variation present. This is likely due to evolutionary and functional reasons. If we were to completely randomize or even partially randomize these positions, this could lead to problematic or immunogenic antibody sequences, as well as dilute uh, the over overall functionality of the library. So we don't. Another aspect of our design is that we use 100% germline framework regions, meaning no mutations in the regions between the CDRs, even if it was observed in our deep sequencing results. Framework mutations can naturally occur during somatic hypermutation in an individual, 
But that mutation could also be immunogenic in a different person, ultimately reducing an antibody drug's efficacy in a patient population. And lastly, we also removed most uh, potential problematic sequence liability motifs, such as deamidation, oxidation, free cysteines, et cetera. By constructing semi-synthetic libraries with these general population weight distribution, distributions at each CDR position, and also allowing all combinatorial sequences for each chain with random pairing of CDRs and heavy and light chains, we find a practical way of introducing sufficient natural diversity with enough quote unquote rearrangement to be able to obtain high affinity and developable antibodies without the need for further affinity maturation. So that was design. Display. A library is only good as how efficiently every antibody can be displayed on the cell surface. As a eukaryotic organism, yeast can properly fold and express proteins, proteins such as antibodies with similar post-translational modifications as mammals. Bacteriophage, on the other hand, has been shown to have unequal display across different frameworks, and there's also translational risk when eventually producing hits in HEC293 or CHO cells. Yeast also grows incredibly fast with a doubling time of about 90 minutes, allowing for rapid preparation of 100 billion clones for each discovery campaign. Screen. Utilizing successive rounds of magnetic so sorting called MAX and fluorescence based sorting FACS, we can rapidly narrow down the pool of 100 billion clones to a panel of 20 to 100 functional antibodies in a matter of weeks or months. The quantitative sensitivity that comes from FACS allows us to enrich and, I and identify the desirable clones efficiently. So we, we did that uh, just that with uh, CD16A. We performed multiple enrichment sorts for uh, the 176V and F binders and a subtractive sort to remove the CD16B binders. We then selected yeast clones and induced secretion of FABs to use for ELISA and flow cytometry analysis. A panel of antibodies were confirmed to have the desired specificity. The HITs were then reform reformatted into IDG1 uh, with the modified FC having silenced effector functions. The affinities of these antibodies to the relevant antigens were measured using the Gator instrument, the BLI, and the results are summarized here. A panel of our antibodies had higher affinities to CD16A, F, V, and CINO compared to a reference antibody currently in clinical trial highlighted in blue. They also did not bind or bound weakly to CD16B, NA1, and NA2. In a cell binding assay with primary NK cells, A23 bound similarly as the reference. And with primary neutrophils, which expressed CD16B, uh, our A A23 and reference did not exhibit any binding to these cells, while our clone A21 only bound at the highest concentration tested. 3G8 antibody shown in purple here is a pan CD16 control antibody. With the Gator Bio system, we are also able to easily perform competitive assays to identify shared or unique antibody epitopes or, or bins. By first immobilizing CD16A onto the biosensor, then sequentially adding a pair of antibodies, we can determine if the second antibody is blocked or not by the first. In this figure uh, shown here in the yellow line, 3G8 bound to CD16A in the presence of A23, meaning they have unique epitopes. The orange line shows A23 blocked itself and serves as a control and confirm that the first antibody was bound to saturation. A summary of the results are shown here, where all of our antibodies share an epitope with the CD16A reference antibody, but not the pan CD16 3G8 antibody, as expected. 
In determining the epitope for our antibodies, we produced single amino acid substitution CD16A variants for two positions highlighted in green, the G147D and Y158H, to revert to CD16B in those positions. A CD16 control clone antibody was able to bind to wild type uh, and these two variants equally by ELISA, confirming these proteins were intact. Clones A21 and A23 lost binding to the tyrosine 158H variant by over 100,000 fold meaning that this single tyrosine at position 158 is the single and critical residue that confers these antibodies CD16A ultra specificity. Shown here is a summary and comparison of clone A23 and the reference antibody. No, not only did our clone have higher affinity to CD16V F alleles and sino, its binding was less attenuated in the presence of 10 mg per mil human IgG than reference antibody. This IgG concentration is approximately the physiological concentration of antibodies circulating within our bloodstream. And while the CD16A interaction with IgGs is rather weak, the reference antibody was still blocked by this level of IgG, and presumably the same attenuating effect could occur in vivo as well. Please take note as we will observe this again, but even more pronounced in subsequent slides. Additionally, A23 outperformed the reference antibody in potential sequence liability, thermostability, and expression. The melting temperatures and aggregation, uh, aggregation temperature associated with our antibodies are consistently higher uh, meaning more stable antibodies uh, that lead to improved expression, efficacy, and shelf life. Now that we have measured the biophysical properties of our CD16A antibodies, we then produced and tested them as bispecific NK cell engagers. Specifically, we coupled uh, them with an anti-CD19 antibody in either a tandem uh, SEFE format or a bivalent tandem SEFE fused with the IgG4FC. Using the latter bispecific engager format uh, and a CD16AV reporter cell line, A21 and A23 are slightly more potent uh, than reference in activating the engineered effector cell in the presence of CD19 expressing Raji cells. All three also activate more than another control shown in purple, which is the same CD19 binder, but as a monoclonal antibody with an enhanced ADCC FC. To put this into context, the enhanced ADCC FC used is the same as margituximab, which is essentially a HER2 FDA approved trastuzumab antibody with the modified FC that demonstrated enhanced NK cell activation, ADCC, and improved clinical benefit over trastuzumab and gained its own FDA approval uh, in 2020. The fact that we see significantly higher activation levels with our NK cell engagers at the same concentrations is really exciting. As a control, uh, incubation without Raji target cells, activity is not detected with any of the tested antibodies, demonstrating the requirement of having both CD16A and CD19 uh, SEFEs binding to their respective targets for activation. And strikingly, A21 and A23 retain their potency even in the presence of the 10 mg per mil IgG, while the reference antibody almost completely loses activity, shown here uh, as the green line. In summary of the EC50 values is shown here, with our panel of antibodies having several orders of magnitude higher potency in activation uh, compared to reference. In the same reporter assay, but in a monovalent tandem SEFE format, we also observe potent Raji cell-dependent reporter cell activation with A21 and A23. 
Reference antibody in this monovalent format has uh, significantly lower potency as well as lower max activation, both without and with 10 mg per mil human IgG, again shown as the green line. Summary of the EC50 values uh, are shown here. Uh, we next looked at functional ADCC-dependent tumor cell killing using primary NK cells co-incubated with our antibodies and Raji cells. In two separate donors, our antibodies mediated higher maximal NK cell-dependent Raji cell killing. And in the presence of 10 mg per mil IgG, A23 retained activity while the reference did not. And in the tandem SEFV format, we are observing around one order of magnitude higher potency with our A21 and A23 antibodies compared to reference. In conclusion, uh, direct comparison with the leading reference CD16A clinical antibody demonstrated Avantgen's clones outperform in terms of both developability and engager activity across various formats and assays. So can NK cell engagers overcome the challenges of T cell immunotherapies? In the near future, we will see how some of the first generation NK cell engagers will perform in phase one and two trials. And we believe the results will be quite promising, yet we'll probably need further improvement. Our next-gen NK cell engagers and CD16A antibodies, coupled with your own novel target antibodies, are available for licensing and code development. If you're interested to learn more, uh, just check out our website at avanchin.com. Uh, reach out and become a partner. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Wong, for excellent educational webinar. Uh, I, there are a few questions have have come up, and I will go through the questions. And again, all the participants, uh, please enter your questions through the Q and A box, and I will take it as as they appear. So, first question, uh, Dr. Wong, for you. And I'm paraphrasing it. Uh, you went over CAR T and T cell engagers and NK cell engagers. What what are your thoughts on CAR and K? Uh, that's a great question. Yes. So obviously there's a a, a gap where I did not mention CAR NK just for um, sake of timing. But if if for those that don't know, CAR NK is is a cell therapy just like CAR-T, but instead of using engineered T cells, you're using the natural killer cells. And in fact, there's actually um, more, more uh, cell therapies with CAR-NK going on in the clinical trial as we speak. And uh, the, the NK cell engagers is probably uh, a step um, later than, a half a step later than that. Um, when when I think of CAR-NK, there, there's definitely similarities to to the uh, CAR T in terms of both the advantages and the limitations, right? It is a cell therapy uh, drug, so you're you're still going to get even if it's allogeneic um, and universal, you're still going to get significant costs in manufacturing and complexity compared to a single recombinant protein, right? As a as an, like, such as an NK cell engager, um, and then the other aspect is that. CAR and K, I believe, will will be deemed safer than CAR T, uh, generalistically speaking. Um, but again, if you don't get a complete um, uh, cure from that initial cell therapy, what's very likely to happen is that you're going to have to um, have a uh, follow up um, uh, treatment with either a um, let's say anti PDL one medicine or other recombinant protein antibodies um, and and very likely to include uh, uh, NK cell engager as an example. Because if we look at um, CAR-T therapy and what's going on there, a lot oftentimes 
uh, they'll get successive treatments with uh, a, a T cell engager later because it's kind of hard to get continuous treatment of cell therapy. But with met, you know, with a recombinant protein, it's a, it's a lot more manageable than that. Um, and the other thing is that I, the one part of CAR and K or, or CAR T is that it would be pretty challenging to have a combination therapy where it's two different cells. So again, speaking to the importance of having these engager molecules, uh, T cell engagers and uh, and K cell engagers, they're more amenable to combination therapy. All right, thank you. Next question is, did you see affinity change when the FABs were converted to SCFVS format? Yes, uh, so not in this case and in general, we see very um, uh, low uh, observations of of any uh, loss when converting either from SCFE from our Avant FA library to a FAB or IgG or the other way around. Um, I think one of the reasons being is just that um, the way that our platform is is made, you know, we're using yeast display. Um, the yeast cells are kind of a good screen for these kind of um, abnormal antibodies that due to whatever folding or rearrangement, it's, it's uh, biophysical properties will change. So, and then uh, the other piece of evidence for that is just our, our melting temperature. So when we run um, uh, DSF or DSC for our molecules, they're, they're all on average uh, pretty high in the, in the mid eighties to, to high eighties Celsius. Um, and so I think that also kind of lends to that, that they're already in a very stable structure and, um, and they won't lose that 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 behavior in, in a different format. Excellent, thank you. Nick, next question is: uh, Can you comment on the Athimed's Athimed's recent NK engagers clinical developments? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so so Athimed is probably one of the earliest companies that that are focusing in the innate immunity um, space and. Um, they have multiple, from from what I've seen, they have multiple clinical trials that are ongoing. I know there's one that's pretty interesting. So they're using, their, so they have uh, what is called AFM13, uh, which is a CD30, CD16A uh, NK cell engager. And they have, they have it as a monotherapy for a while, but what they they also have are using core uh, derived NK cells um, as a self car NK therapy. Um, but what they found is that the 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 efficacy of the the NK cell by itself is not as much as if they pre incubate those cells uh, with their NK cell engager um, before infusing it into uh, patients. So what that means, they're effectively priming their cells, activating the NK cells using their own NK cell engager. In this case, it's a CD16A engager like ours, um, and then uh, putting it back into patients. And I and this they had an announcement I think about a year ago uh, from the ASCO conference where the results are quite remarkable, where the the improvement in um, the the ORR was a hundred percent. So all patients. Um, responded to the objective. And then they also had a, a significant jump from the complete response or CRR from 30 something percent to about 60, 65%. So I, I think that in that one case, it's it's very exciting to see. Uh, so that's, I think, currently phase, phase one, two trial. And so we're hoping that the moment um, we see more evidence of this, that um, you know, a lot of companies will will draw attention um, uh, into this area. All right, thank you. Next question is about uh, library design. And the question is, is it possible to use the same human antibody database to optimize an existing antibody? Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, so we have our human anti um, antibody database and we apply it not just to 
our existing naive libraries. We can also uh, generate custom libraries or, or libraries centered around um, a pre-existing antibody sequence. So for example, antibody optimization or affinity maturation, this is something that we actively do. Um, and, and oftentimes, um, Clients have their lead candidates um, that were discovered from other means. Uh, very frequently, they're actually from um, humans, transgenic mouse models, and they still need uh, further affinity improvement. Uh, and, and based off our database, we can then construct a rationally designed library. And then using the same rapid screening process uh, within weeks or months, we were able to uh, improve the affinity or, or optimize it or germline it, et cetera. Um, and usually on average, our uh, affinity maturation projects, we achieve about 10 to 100 fold improvement. So a lot of times uh, a client has a, a lead molecule around the 15 nanomolar range that typically, and then we usually try to drive that down to single digit nanomolar or picomolar. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Uh, one more question. I'm interested in NK cell engages, but I don't have antibodies yet for my target of interest. Can Avangen help with that as well? Yes, absolutely. So our, our core platform that I explained um, is to generate uh, functional and uh, therapeutic antibodies. Uh, and in this case, we generate against CD16A, but it, it can be extended to a wide variety of targets. So if you're interested in, in either ADCs even or, or IgG's um, monoclonal antibodies or NK cell engagers, and you still need um, to identify uh, a panel of, of antibody sequences, we're here to, to work with you on that. So yeah, definitely, if you're interested, um, check our website out and, and we have a, a form there that you can uh, fill out and reach out to us. All right, thank you. Uh, another question, and this is for Dr. Bell. Um, and the question is about AV. Why are AV probes listed as Q only? We routinely work with Gator to use them for K assays. Uh, so the reason these are listed as, as Q only, because if you talk about AAV, the most important critical quality attributes that people are interested in are capsid titer, genome titer, and MTN full ratios. So the most common use for these probes is Q. But if you have, a, have an application where you want to test the kinetic, the binding of, let's say, an antibody or another molecule that binds to the AAV, then yes, these probes can be used for that application as well. But the reason these are only listed as Q is because most commonly people are interested in um, quantifying their capsid titer, and that's what they use these probes for. All right. So, so thank, thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, we have enough, we have almost out of time. It's 10 a.m. I would like to thank Dr. Jordan Wong and Dr. Vasundra Bell for a very educational uh, talk. And I also want to let the participants know that the, the recording of this webinar will be available for, uh, for you, and we will be sending a link. If you're interested in, in slides, because there were questions about, can we have slides? And, and I think, uh, Dr. Wong, if you can comment on that, whether you can share the slides, that would be great. <clears throat> so I'd be happy to share. Yeah, so we will uh, send the slides. Please send us your request for slides to info at gatorbio.com. With that, uh, again, thank you to all participants and presenters. And we look forward to seeing you again in our next uh, series of webinars coming uh, very shortly. Again, thank you and have a good day or good good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you. Have a good day.